Hello, welcome to Am I Neurodivergent? These videos are a run through of my weird autism and ADHD year and the highs and lows of, of getting a surprise adult diagnosis. Chapter 9, week 9, is going to be all about the ADOS 2 autism assessment. What my mindset was going into the ADOS, what the assessment itself was like, and then what the aftermath was like, so the before, during, and after. It's not for everyone. Some people enjoy it and find it an interesting process, but the formal assessment and everything around it was a really stressful experience for me, and I think it is for a lot of us getting a late diagnosis. So hopefully this video will demystify the assessment process a little bit and let anyone know who's maybe about to get a formal autism assessment or thinking of getting one that it's okay to freak out about it. It's just objectively a really weird experience and you obviously feel like you're under a huge microscope which we tend to hate but you basically just have to be honest about yourself and talk about yourself in a very unguarded way uh, which again we tend to hate particularly if we've spent many years masking and camouflaging our challenges and um, this might be another slightly longer video sorry there's a lot to unpack for me and I guess a lot of people who ultimately do get a late diagnosis your assessment day ends up being pretty much one of the most significant days of your life, actually. So the assessment itself is going to have been, or likely will be, if it still lies ahead for you, a huge deal for a lot of us. So first, what is the ADOS 2? It stands for Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule Second Edition, so good to have an acronym. And it's one of the most common clinical assessment tools, at least here in the UK, used to evaluate individuals suspected of having autism spectrum disorder. Sidebar, can we please all start calling it autism spectrum condition, ASC, not a disorder, just a difference. Anyway, the, the ADOS 2 is the same broad format, slightly tweaked for both children and adults, which gets a bit weird, and I'll cover why in a second. The assessment consists of two distinct parts. Number one, a standardized set of questions and uh, two tasks that are designed to tease out social, cognitive and communicative behaviors and differences that are indicative of autism. So first, the before and leading up to the, the assessment. After self-diagnosing and going deep down the Google rabbit hole, I was pretty convinced though still not 100% convinced that I'd been autistic all this time. There was just too much recognition that explained all the weird reactions to things and odd behaviours I've had to things over the years that I could never quite explain about myself before but that autism now seemed to. But getting a formal assessment is crunch time, right? You either are or you're not at this point. And I was an absolute mess before my assessment, convinced I had imposter syndrome, that I was over-masking, that I was now under-masking and showing my vulnerabilities too much, or that they'd, they'd say I just needed to pull my socks up, that I'd be written off by a professional as just a delusional loon and told to just go back to my life and just try harder to be better at it, you loser. So I turned up to my appointment ridiculously early, paced up and down and chain-smoked outside the building, practicing the points I wanted to remember about myself, and then finally went in. At the start of the assessment, I was actually physically trembling sitting in the chair. I'd, I'd got myself so wound up, and from what I'd read and discussed with others who'd gone through the formal assessment, I don't think it's that uncommon to feel this stressed out by the whole experience. Like, either the rest of your life and the way you think about yourself is about to change forever, or you're about to feel like the biggest effing idiot in the world who's just wasted a lot of money and or time and is about to be told to go away and get a grip of yourself. So the during bit now, the first hour or so of the ADOS is an interview. It's pitched as an informal chat about yourself, but it's clearly very structured and, and tick boxy. I'd wildly over-prepared for the assessment, because of course I had, and had brought a, a multiple 
page briefing pack about myself, including the complete developmental history form I'd filled in for the NHS autism pre-screening that I'd, I'd previously filled in to get onto the very long NHS waiting list. If you've not done one of these prior to your formal assessment, by the way, think about and have answers to some of these questions before you go, because they will ask about it. So for, for info, developmental history forms, it's normally filled in alongside a parent or someone who knew you as a child. It covers stuff like what you were like as a baby and as a child, when you started to speak, if there were any speech delays, or alternatively, if, if you had a particularly strong vocabulary as a kid, which apparently I did. If you socialised well with other kids, uh, whether you tended to have overly focused or repetitive play activities, whether you had any issues with particular foods or clothing textures, uh, whether you were a tactile huggy child or alternatively um, didn't really like being touched, how you found busy, noisy places and situations, whether you had any repetitive stress behaviours like hand flapping or rocking or tapping. They ask you about your medical history and whether you spent any time in hospital for anything. Uh, as you moved through school and became a teen, how well you socialised or if you preferred time spent on your own, whether you enjoyed group activities or were more comfortable in your own company, um, how you dealt with big changes like moving house or changing schools, whether you liked going on holidays or not, whether you enjoyed routines and would be, would be bothered by a routine being changed. Um, Plus, I'd additionally noted down loads of traits and behaviours since self-diagnosing that seemed to be in some way now possibly explained by being on the autism spectrum. All of these notes about my life and things that had confused me about the way I'd reacted to things over the years, I'd arranged and annotated chronologically because, you know, autism and order. Um, my notes were peppered with a ton of my weird behaviours over the years, all annotated with little notes. Could this be autism? I referenced to my notes during my interview uh, to help remind me of stuff I might forget or overlooked, and uh, they were fine with that. Someone else I spoke to recently said they took a ton of notes in with them as well, um, setting out their own reflections about themselves. It's clearly what, what we do. Anyway, the clinician slash psychiatrist talks all this through. Um, they were impressed with the extent of my notes and asked if they could keep a copy of them afterwards. So don't um, don't feel bad about, about taking notes in with you. Um, and they, they gather information about your medical and developmental history, um, but ask even more about your current challenges and concerns and things that bother you as an adult, like um, how you like to socialise and communicate uh, and about your interests and hobbies and how you like to spend your spare time now. They asked me why I wanted an assessment and uh, for me it was stuff I've talked about in, in previous uh, videos. Scoring high-ish on the online AQ test uh, indicating significant autistic traits. The more I started reading, the more I recognised behaviours and coping mechanisms I'd developed over the years to try to appear uh, normal, like stuff I've talked about, preparing scripts and practicing conversations ahead of time and having hundreds of email folders and subfolders that I have to check each and every day to, to make sure I'm coping at work and in my personal life. I said I wanted the assessment mainly to determine if in fact I did have ASD. Um, I talked about finding my job very stressful, particularly interacting with colleagues and finding task initiation very ambiguous and, and difficult, procrastination and just just getting started with things uh, I found harder than others seemed to find it. It seemed like ASD could potentially be an explanation for all this. Um, by the way, that that procrastination and task initiation is a, is a thing called autistic inertia, which I'll cover in a future video. But having had to take some time off work, I was now worried that work pressures in particular were unsustainable and that I maybe just couldn't cope with them anymore, having had a pretty bad exhaustion burnout and, and whether future work adjustments might be possible with the diagnosis. But mainly it was it was to determine whether the difficulties... I'd been experiencing were genuinely symptoms of ASD or whether they were something else uh, and if it was autism 
to try to maybe adjust the ways I've been trying to cope with life and, and fit in and perform as well as I felt I could. Because the, the stuff I'd been doing just wasn't working anymore. It was to understand myself and learn some better coping mechanisms, uh, basically. Um, if I'm feeling overwhelmed and panicked, and, and these tools and techniques would likely have to be different if I was actually autistic. So that was that was why I wanted to know that was the answer I gave and they, they seemed okay um, with that answer. They really wanted to get into difficulties and frustrations and for me a lot of it was just the damn effort it all took and the importance to me of looking like I'm coping but always having to go at 200 miles an hour under the surface uh, just to come across as normal and chilled out and on top of things. For whatever reason, particularly as I've got older, it's been really important to me to look like I'm nailing life. And the effort of doing that eventually uh, burnt me out. They also asked me some questions I really struggled to answer, uh, like what makes me happy and what makes me sad, what makes me angry, what makes me lonely. Like... Those questions kind of threw me a bit, to be honest. I think I'd prepared a lot of behaviour-based examples and frustrations, but I hadn't really thought a lot about emotional impact, if that makes sense. I, I remember these questions being quite a difficult part of the assessment process for me, but the assessors uh, knew what they were doing and kind of probed a bit more to get under the surface a bit of those things. One of the questions was, uh, do I enjoy living on my own? I said... I enjoyed living with my wife, but on occasion she was away traveling for work. And on those occasions, I did enjoy living on my own because I went what I called full bachelor and, and stayed up ridiculously late, uh, stayed up ridiculously late uh, watching crap TV and eating junk food and getting no sleep and letting the flat get really untidy. I sort of laughed and said my wife called it me going feral uh, when I was left unsupervised, but the assessor just looked a bit sad and said, no, that's just lack of executive function. So that was a bit deflating. Um, anyway, that's broadly what the interview section covers. It, it is what it is. You're basically just describing yourself and, and how you feel. It's quite nice in some ways to talk about yourself unguarded and depending on the skill of the assessor, mine was really good. Um, they actually managed to make you feel quite at ease. So once... The interview section's complete. They begin the observational part of the assessment. This gets a bit weirder because it typically involves a series of structured tasks and activities, such as completing puzzles to see whether you're a, a big picture thinker or more details focused, zeroing in more on individual elements. You also look at pictures in a storybook and have to describe what you think's going on. Uh, mine was a, a kid having a fantastical dream. These are the bits that are clearly more child-focused, that they've sort of adapted for adult assessments, but yeah, it's it's a bit odd. A, f a friend of mine, also in his 40s, who also went through an adult assessment, um, was given toy cars to play with, to observe how he played with them. I mean, anyway, um, these things will improve, but we are where we are. Um, they also pay close attention to non-verbal cues, such as eye contact, facial expressions, repetitive movements, body posture, emotional responses to, to frustrations while you're going through some of these tasks. This is hard not to second guess if you've got really good at masking over a long period. But I guess the main thing they're, they're looking for is your cognitive differences and preferences in the problem solving exercises. <clears throat> For me, we spent much longer on the interview, I think, than the tasks. I think the task section seemed slightly ridiculous for all of us, but I guess they got what they were looking for. Um, I think another reason I find the assessment so stressful and why I was second-guessing myself so much was that I'd spoken with a really nice autism and ADHD therapist the week prior to talk about how nervous I was about the ADOS, and she explicitly told me to try not to mask during the assessment. When you've masked for decades and you're just finding out it's even been masking, it's really bloody difficult to flick a switch and just not mask anymore or even know what not masking looks or feels like. like you're just you by this point. And if you've gone for decades undiagnosed, 
your kind of jumbled up mess of your authentic self covered up with the persona you think you have to present to the outside world. Anyway, I was I was so nervous I didn't have worried about it to be honest. I I really struggled to make eye contact with the assessors, which I'm I'm normally okay with. Um though I did get better with it as the as the assessment wore on and, and I got more comfortable. But I I think my advice would be try not to overthink your responses and behaviours. Just try to take off all of your armour as much as possible and, and be as honest as you can be. I think I was extra nervous because I'd already basically self-diagnosed in my head already and essentially didn't want them to F up what I knew was probably the right answer. I guess I understood intellectually that they know what they're doing and what they're looking for. But I also think when you go in for an, an assessment as an adult, you go in carrying a lot of baggage about how the outside world, including doctors and healthcare professionals, clearly hasn't seen your internal struggles and doesn't spot the signs and that they haven't all this time. I mean, there's a reason autism's often called an invisible disability, right? And you don't want to leave anything to chance, hence all the notes we tend to produce and, and worrying. There's a lot of importance for you personally, hanging on the judgment of a professional opinion, of a profession you probably don't have 100% confidence in at this point, having been missed and let down for so many years. But at this point, you probably just have to trust the system a little bit and trust they know what they're looking for when you've actually specifically instructed them to look for it. Um, but we're probably feeling so shaken over being missed for so long by this stage, it's it's hard to have that confidence in the system, um, quite frankly. And I've got no doubt that baggage all plays into the stress and anxiety this whole formal assessment process can produce. And that's it, basically. It's a waiting game now. We're into the, the after. Getting the results generally seem to take about two weeks. I really don't understand why, but that's the time period uh, that seems pretty standard. I'm not going to lie, those two weeks are going to feel horrible. I spent the first few days emailing the clinic with things I felt I'd forgotten to mention. Uh, like After going over the questions and my answers with my wife the next day, I suddenly felt like I'd masked too much in the assessment. For example, I'd, I'd said I didn't really have a huge problem with food or clothes, and my wife pointed out, you can't eat anything with seeds in it, you freak out about stringy vegetables, you hate labels, and you can't wear a tie because you freak out if anything touches your throat. And I think, because I was still so new into understanding the condition and so early on the journey, it didn't even occur to me at that point these were common autism things. Like I still wasn't differentiating between my quirks and eccentricities and what were, for want of a better word, symptoms. So yeah, I, I panic emailed the clinic updates to all the interview answers I wanted to change and then started beating myself up and couldn't sleep that I now looked too desperate to get a diagnosis rather than get at the truth and they were going to think I was I was faking it. Um, hello again, imposter syndrome, my old friend. I think all the second guessing, the fear of a no, and feeling stupid, the going over and over in your head any comments the assessor might have made and overanalyzing them, are all things that are quite common as you go through the wait afterwards. I heard nothing back for days after sending these follow-up emails, then received a very short email from the assessor to say thank you for the additional information, but she can't assess new info that wasn't discussed in the assessment and, uh, quote, it wouldn't have made a difference to the outcome anyway. I then had to, to wait days and days more for my report, and I read so much into that last phrase and was convinced it was going to be a no, and that my spiralling was some kind of different mental health issue that wasn't autism, and I would be back to the drawing board trying to work out what was going on with me. Then, and I'm jumping ahead in my recap journey a couple of weeks, but just to kind of wrap this up this kind of segment on the ADOS. After a couple of weeks, I finally got the diagnosis and report, and I was officially deemed to be on the autism spectrum. And I just cried 
with the sense of relief and validation that I wasn't going crazy and this was a real thing about me. I mean, I think even if it was a no at this point that you don't meet the diagnostic criteria, I really think I would have persisted and had another assessment. I've mentioned before a couple of times um, the, the University of Washington findings that the vast majority of people who self-diagnose as autistic are autistic. And I'm aware of many people in the community who, who clearly are autistic, but who haven't been deemed to have met the diagnostic criteria for a formal diagnosis. And, and that just sucks. It's, it's not the be all and end all. Self-diagnosis is valid if it helps you understand yourself. But the validation of getting a formal diagnosis and having that certainty can be very important to a lot of us, and, and it was for me. So, yeah, very long video. Um, sorry, but I hope that was a helpful summary and demystification of the ADOS2 autism assessment process. Uncertainty often really stresses us when we're on the spectrum, and I couldn't find an awful lot about the process of the ADOS2 assessment prior to mine. So I hope this video helps plug that gap a little bit for at least uh, a few people and makes the process feel a bit less intimidating and a, a bit more surmountable. Um, thanks a lot. Please do like this video, share this video, subscribe to this channel, all that stuff that'll help me grow these things. And um, yeah, I hope to see you next time when we start working out what to do next after getting a diagnosis and how to start using that information to feel a bit more in control of what you individually and all of us collectively might do next. Um, cheers, everyone. We've got this. Try to stay chill. Bye.